Hi there, I'm Moira Crivelenti, a junior researcher in the Center for Social Studies and the host of this episode of the Mediatized EU podcast series. Today's discussion is part of a series dedicated to the, to the EU-funded Mediatized EU project, which studies how the media discourses are constructed to foster or hamper the European project and how they resonate among the public by focusing on the elite media public triangle. This series of interviews will help our audience, policymakers, experts, journalists, and the general public to understand the project's research components, such as the media analysis and the interview analysis in each target country. If you're interested in finding out more about the project and the people behind it, uh, all you have to do is to visit our website at www.mediatize.eu and subscribe to our newsletter. Um, apart from uh, following us on Twitter at mediatized underscore EU. But allow me to introduce my research colleagues in Belgium uh, into this interview. Samuel Dovery Westerbayer is the director of the European Neighborhood Council, the ENC, and usually the host of this podcast series. And Azuman Kubrebash is the ENC's project manager. So uh, we've reached month 31 of the project and have already completed the media analysis. So I'd like to start by asking, what are the key findings of media analysis in Belgium? Uh, thanks a lot, Mara, for, uh, for hosting us today and, and for uh, starting this conversation. So when, when we did the media analysis, um, we tried to give a detailed examination of the pros and antis um, positions of the European Union and discourses. And we focused particularly on identity and, and pragmatic narratives that were expressed across the Belgian media. And we covered a timeline, which was between August uh, 2021 and March uh, 2022. And, and, and we went through a whole range of uh, different um, different samples, so meaning different types of media that we looked at. Um, and especially this was complex because the Belgian context is such that there is both a Francophone linguistic group as well as a, a Flemish linguistic group and a capital which shares both, although tilted more towards the Francophone language. And so we had a look at a sample of various types of um, media which included mainstream public uh, broadcasters uh, like VRT and RTBF, which are the biggest ones, both for Flemish and for Francophone, as well as mainstream newspapers. So we had a look again at Francophone Le Soir and Flemish The Standard. And then we also selected fringe or let's say alternative and online outlets like Dorbrak.be, which is more of a right right-wing leaning and um, far right leaning uh, form of media, as well as Medor, which is a magazine that's published quarterly in, in Belgium and it's francophone. And so the findings were rather interesting and the way in which we got to these findings, I don't know if we'll talk about more about this in more detail, but let me just explain the process that, that went about. We, we tried to to use a, a computer program or software program called Invivo that essentially identifies dominant discourses and, and that kind of mines through thousands of um, media articles or snippets from television and, and, uh, and from these online outlets that we had selected. So we had this enormous uh, essentially sample of media, which we then use this computer program to siphon through and to then find dominant discourses and then also look at counter discourses and then take into account these, you know, pro and anti narratives on, on Europeanization, which were both pragmatic and identitarian. And interestingly, coming to your question, Moara, is that one of the conclusions that we, we observed is that there is a, a linguistic division with regards to Europeanization in Belgium. And we saw that in the Flemish media, for example, which we also understand to be due to uh, regionalized media laws, which are different in different linguistic communities, we saw that, for example, in the Flemish media, 
there was a much higher tendency to give space to fringe and even far-right anti-EU discourses. It wasn't so much because the media itself or the journalists were anti-EU or had anti-EU views, but more because they gave more space to the right wing or uh, parties that are traditionally less pro-European compared to their francophone journalist counterparts because in the francophone part of Belgium, there has been for a long time an informal agreement between the media outlets. It's called the Media Cordon Sanitaire, which essentially is an agreement between the media partners not to allocate much, if any, uh, airspace or broadcasting space to right-wing or extremist views um, in in, the, in politics. And so here under, of course, also very anti or, or um, Eurosceptic opinions and, and so on. So that was a very important conclusion that we found. Another um, important conclusion that we also saw and noticed was that there is a there is a kind of a mainstreaming or standardization of the weaponization discourse surrounding migration. So, whereas 10, 15 years ago, when we we're looking at this, especially in the desk research that we that we conducted before, we were seeing very little strong pro-EU anti-migration rhetoric. So we, we wouldn't have you know, the same discourses surrounding Frontex. We wouldn't have the same discourses surrounding the weaponization of migration by by um, by belligerent or by malign actors like Belarus and so on. And, and instead, this is something that we found now. So we've seen the mainstreaming of the weaponization of migration. That's a definite conclusion, I would say, in the in the in the media analysis as well. And then a third interesting uh, also conclusion is that we we also saw a rather mixed. Um, it was not as clear as some of the other conclusions, but we saw kind of a mixed both pro and anti discourses on COVID nineteen as well as on EU budgets. Uh, for example, in some Flemish uh, outlets, we saw more critical views on EU budgets, whereas in some francophone ones, we saw a more pro one. And which also reflects very much the the duality of of the of this case of Belgium essentially, and then the final conclusion, which I think is worth mentioning as well, is that we also noticed various types of very mild pro Russianness in some discourses, and they were, for example, arguments that masked sentiments about price fears or also that called for uh, or called for um, awareness about Russia's security concerns. And, um, and so there were some uh, concerns about, for example, nuclear weapons and also questions surrounding price and detachment from energy of Russia, all of which have now at least become standard kind of pro-Russian narratives. At the time, one has to also be careful one, how one places these um, conclusions, because, of course, it's not fair to say that they're pro-Russian, but there were mild elements of pro-Russian arguments in them, some of them, you know, without any specific attachment uh, to Russia in any shape, way or form, and, and other of them possibly due to disinformation and malinformation, which has spilled over. So those were, were some of the main uh, main findings uh, from uh, our uh, media analysis. Thank you. Uh, so let me move on to the second topic of today's episode, the analysis of elite interviews. Key discourses reviewed through the media analysis in each country have been transformed into the statements that make the basis for the next stage of analysis, that is in-depth interviews with uh, political and uh, media elites. So I want to ask, how do elite interviews add to the data from media analysis and what novel findings are available? Thank you, Maura. So for the elite interview analysis, our goal, just like our partners, was to find how the discourses we found in Belgian media resonate among political and media actors and how they perceive these discourses on the European project and the Europeanization of Belgium. 
For that purpose, as you mentioned, we conducted um, 50 interviews and analyzed the data by using two methodology, discourse analysis and, and um, content analysis. And I would say the findings are quite interesting. Um, first of all, Samuel explained this a bit, but I would like to start by um, emphasizing the complex nature of Belgium's media and political landscape, because of course it posed a challenge in the sense that different communities in the country have different regulatory and political rules, which are largely based on, on, on the unique historical and linguistic divisions, which render the case of Belgium also pretty unique. Despite such divisions, I believe it's remarkable that limited levels of immediate or easily detectable uh, polarization uh, were obvious at first sight in our data. Um, before I go into details, I could generally say that, um, that while the media and political actors continue to take a strongly pro-EU stance, um, it's becoming evident that there is criticism of the EU in a number of areas most notably regarding migration, as Samuel mentioned, and, and to a lesser extent, the economic impact of the war in Ukraine. So when it comes to the findings of the Q analysis, we found a group that is pro-EU and promotes a new European identity position, which is likely a consequence of the war in Ukraine, as well as a um, fusion of previously Eurosceptic parties like New Flemish Alliance, NEA, and more traditionally pro-EU parties. Mm. There is another group which on the surface uh, remains pro-EU in many sense, but additionally has a strongly critical EU stance on the EU's um, own human rights records, uh, particularly surrounding the migration issue. And this group includes, for example, progressive environment environmentalist parties across linguistic lines, as well as a media actor from the leftist online media outlet, Meter. And the last group, uh, which we labeled as pro-EU pragmatists, but with a critical view of the handling of the war in Ukraine and the EU's dealings with, with Russia. And, and this group includes social democratic parties, some mainstream media, and historically pro-EU parties like Open VLD. And um, they all share varying degrees of concerns about the, the risk of an escalation in the situation in Ukraine and hold a cautious yet pragmatic perspective on budgetary sharing at the EU level with regards to handling external and internal threats. Um, in addition to these findings, um, within the separated data for politicians, we also found another important factor that gives us further findings on geopolitics and securitization. Um, and and in, in this factor, the unusual combination of the parties like um, right wing, Eurosceptic, and MEA is grouped together with historically liberal pro EU open VLD. So, in here, a highly pragmatic but also new identity base. Uh, pro discourse, uh, pro EU discourse is found, which re reflects a more EU foreign policy dr driven uh, prioritization. Uh, so that's it for the Q part. But when it comes to the findings of the second part of the report, it also highlights some expected and unexpected results. Um, it is, I think, particularly revealing how um, new forms of hegemonic discourse and weaponization surrounding Europeanization, migration and geopolitics are present and in some parts very complementary to our media analysis. So first of all, um, the political and media elites in Belgium again have a strong pro-European Union stance, but there is still room for counter discourses and some of which are critical as we found in the Q-analysis part. Um, what is generally observed in here is that although there might be slightly different ways of conceiving the European identity, it remains popular amongst all actors while pragmatic considerations appear um, as an easy vehicle for catch-all argu arguments void of political choice. Um, perhaps the most revealing finding, which is 
also complementary to the Q analysis is a strong focus on geopolitics, security and enlargement uh, from a foreign policy perspective. There are also some supporting findings between media analysis and elite analysis. For example, we witness um, language distinction among political and media actors continuing to converge and becoming less distinct on Europeanization and the European project. Uh, although the absence of the far right, um, EU critical Vlaams Blanc and the far left ETB PVDA seems to be a drawback when investigating this. Um, the fact that the sample includes members of the um, of both the right and left leaning progressive parties nevertheless strongly support this uh, this finding, I believe. Um, also, uh, the war in Ukraine appears to have contributed to to the convergence of views on the EU's perceptions as it occurs on the Europe's borders. And that take us to the significance of the securitization of the subjects such as migration um, and other topic chosen for the media analysis of Belgium. And in summary, uh, our report shows that the European project remains highly consensual across Belgian media and political actors unifying conservative and, and liberal actors across linguistic lines. But um, it also shows an important distinction, distinction in the sense that traditional social democratic actors remain more hesitant as opposed to conservative liberal and central political actors which favor a strong pro-EU stance on, on liberal values and, and all, also geopolitics. And it, it also shows that a growing division appears to, to exist regarding migration and the heightened trend of migration weaponization, as Sam mentioned, whereas the traditionally Eurosceptic parties have adopted a more securitized and geopolitical Europeanization discourse, which takes an anti-migration view with the ethnic and geopolitical exceptionalism surrounding um, around Ukraine. So I'll stop here in order to stay within the 15 to 20 minutes margin. But um, indeed, as you mentioned in the beginning, those who would like to learn more about findings of the project and in our case of our case, can visit our website. Thank you so much, Mara. Thank you, Azu. So mm -hmm. our discussion has come to an end, and I would like to thank Samuel and Azuman for taking the time to join me and explaining how they conducted media analysis and elite interview in Belgium. Uh, I'm Moara Krivelenci, and that was our, another episode of the Mediatize EU podcast series. Mm -hmm.